of Joel and and by Remy Chimney. Who's your teacher this year? My teacher this year is Mrs. Perdomo. Lucky girl. Okay, would, would you like to leave us lead us in the patriotic exercise? Yes. In the pledge? Yes. <laughs> okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag the of the United States, States of America, of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, for liberty and justice, and justice for all. For all. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you could join us. Yay. Whoops. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice job. All right. So now it's time for roll call. Um, Trustee Wong? Here. Trustee Reed? Here. Trustee Mudd? Here. Trustee Sarpango? Here. And Trustee Kendall here. Okay, so do we, um, we're looking at the agenda. Do we have a motion to approve the agenda? I'll make a motion to approve the agenda. In a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, um, now the minutes, um, unless there's something that somebody wants to change um, or else do we have a motion to approve the minutes from the December 15th, 20, um, that should be 2020. Meeting, yeah. <laughs> I can move to approve the minutes from December 15, 2020. And a uh, second? I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. Uh, okay, aye. <laughs> so um, now we have public statements um, related to non-agenda topics and I'd like to read about that first. So public statements at the discretion of the board of trustees the public may address the board on non-agenda topics and or agenda items. If you choose to make a public statement, you will need to complete and submit the district's Google form for public statements. This can be found on the district website, um, www.berlingameschools.org. So you click on the district, you click on board of trustees and link to the form in the link to the forms on the right-hand side. So then the moderator will call on you. Please note that the comments are um, limited to three minutes. The board president may increase or decrease the amount of time allowed for public presentation, depending upon the topic and the number of persons wishing to be heard. If your comment is on an, agenda, um, an item that is not on the agenda, then you'll be asked to speak during the public statements relating to non-agenda topics at the beginning of the meeting. If your comment is an item on the agenda, then you'll be called on to speak at that time in the agenda. So now um, is a section for public statements related to non-agenda topics. Kirsten, do we have um, any statements? Yes, we do, President Kendall. We have one from Trisha Tayama. All right. All right, Trisha, there you are. I think you're unmuted and you can speak. Maybe not. Um, she has been promoted to a panelist and should be able to speak. Okay, Trisha, can you? Um... Uh, <clears throat> one possibility uh, on the request to address the board, she put a full name in that we're not seeing. The name she was using in Zoom is not showing up in the list. Um, so we went with the one Trisha we saw um, and no response yet. So it might not be the right. It may not be the right one. Okay. Um, are, you, are you guys still looking? Yeah, I see no other Trisha in the attendees and Trisha as a guest is a panelist and has the option to speak. I think you might just need to move on. Okay. All right, let's move along then. Um, so we've we talked about public statements related to agenda items. Um, and do we have any at this point, Kirsten, that we need to be aware of? No. So next is the statement of the principal. That is Dr. Carla Torres. Thank you. Hello, Dr. Torres. Hi, good evening. Buenas tardes, everyone. 
Um, on behalf of all the principals, we would like to wish all our stakeholders a healthy, happy new year filled with hope. May hope fill each of our schools and the homes of our families for believing in themselves to climb over mountains we have never climbed before, for continuing positive self-talk and telling ourselves we think we can, we think we can. Like the little engine that could, we thank our students for embracing a growth mindset and for being so resilient. Even at a distance, many of our kindergarten students, our youngest, are reading stories. We acknowledge the extraordinary efforts from all our staff that either directly or indirectly impact our students. Thank you to our teachers for not only teaching the academic standards to our students, but for loving our students and showing them how much each of them are cared for. Thank you to all stakeholders for the valiant collaboration and supporting each other whether it is problem solving around staff shortages, updating safety plans, helping access COVID tests for staff and students, providing professional development on the concurrent classroom, helping with the technology setup, and for most of all, for the patience and flexibility as we ourselves persevere through the many challenges presented this school year. We would like to ask our families to continue supporting us by working in partnership with our schools around all the safety protocols as set in each of our return to school site plans. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so next we have the state uh, statement of our Assistant Superintendent of Educational Services, Marla Silversmith. Good evening and welcome. Um, I'd like to welcome you also to the 2021 um, year. It's a great new year. Uh, yesterday we had grade level meetings where all the grade levels got together and they started planning their asynchronous day which is scheduled for the 19th. So if you have a student in TK through fifth grade that day will be an asynchronous day while well, staff is trained on um, some professional learning and they have some time at their site to go over um, any trainings that's needed there. And then we'll also have supports out in the classrooms to help with connectivity issues and setups within the classroom to welcome back our students in TK through second grade on the 20th. And we are really excited to um, have them come back on the 20th. So thank you for your time and appreciate. and. Again, asynchronous only on the 19th for grades TK through fifth and six through eight will be attending school as typical for a um, Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you, Marla. All right, so um, Superintendent Chris Mount Benitez, you have your statement. Good evening, trustees and community and stakeholders. Uh, so welcome back everybody. Happy, happy new year. I hope everybody's finding a silver lining uh, something to look forward to and be hopeful about in a time that's been uh, it's been tough to find those things. So I'm hoping a new year brings us all a renewed sense of hope. Uh, I have been getting a lot of questions uh, in the past uh, week, week and a half since we've been back uh, about vaccines. So um, there still isn't much more out there other than what we're hearing on the news. Uh, so educators, uh, including uh, staff that works directly with children, uh, we are in tier 1B and we're the very first group in tier 1B. That's after uh, uh, medical professionals and first responders. Um, and so we are still waiting to hear the details of, of when that will start. Uh, the county is, is passing along information as they get it. However, information has not been uh, easy to come by. So we haven't really heard anything more than that. Uh, the one glimmer of hope I had was that uh, our school nurses, um, our LVN and our RN, uh, were approved for vaccination uh, after some discussion about making sure that, that school nurses uh, got uh, vaccinated with other healthcare providers. So uh, that first initial uh, step was, was good to hear about. And of course, uh, I've had a lot of requests, as I indicated in my, my communication last week, to uh, discuss um, our waiver and adding grade levels to our waiver. Uh, that will not be taken up until the February meeting as I communicated um, in, the, in the written communication, but just so that folks are aware. So uh, that's it. Thanks for everybody coming back and continued efforts. It was wonderful to hear from you, Principal Torres. Uh, uplifting, we need that, that's great. And uh, that's it for me this week. Great, thank you. So next we have statements of the board members, uh, Trustee Wong. Um, nothing big to report, just happy new year, new year, everyone, and hope your winter break 
was relaxing and everybody's refreshed and ready to go. <laughs> All right, uh, Trustee Reed. Everybody, um, good to see you. Um, a couple just quick updates. Uh, BCE, I know they sent out a survey to their donors to get a check on where their, their priorities lay and how they make their donations. And that's closing tonight. So they just wanted me to put that message out there for anyone that is listening that hasn't filled out their survey. Um, and they also, one of the most exciting events that they have, the Readathon is coming up um, the 25th through the 29th. It's exciting that one of their events can happen regardless of whether we're in person or virtual. So I know that will be fun. Um, hopefully everyone kind of has the same experience of kids getting up, reading their books, being excited, tracking their minutes and all of that for that week um, and to get off screens for a little while. I'm looking forward to that. Um, and then a big thank you to the PTA and PTA council and all of the parent volunteers. I actually went over to Roosevelt today and picked up my first round of um, testing for the kids. I know they've been working really hard and organizing, getting communication out and working with um, curative and collecting and submitting all of the tests that people are bringing in. So that's pretty exciting to see that start to happen. Um, and I think that's pretty much it for me. Thank you. All right, Trustee um, Sarpangal. Thanks, uh, no major statements other than uh, Happy New Year, uh, as Florence mentioned. And um, uh, I also just wanted to mention that, you know, we, we are very aware of how challenging these times are. and. You know, we do appreciate the efforts and perspectives of everybody from staff to parents to the students. And, um, you know, we know, you know, especially with respect to this pandemic, some people want to go back in person, some people don't, some people want a waiver, some people don't, some people want it one time and another. Um, we, we, we are aware of the sort of varying perspectives. We welcome hearing them, but, but we are we are aware of the challenges that sort of everybody is facing. And, um, you know, we, we are trying to make the best uh, decisions in the interest of the student population as a whole. Um, and um, so we kind of thank you for understanding that uh, it's, it's inherently a difficult uh, thing to balance, but, um, you know, we, we are aware that kind of <clears throat> every decision that is made doesn't necessarily work for everybody, but, um, so far, I have been pleased with the constructive manner in which um, people have expressed their opinion and that, uh, as Trustee Reed mentioned, uh, I think in the last call, um, that's very much welcome and productive and um, we do what we can. And, and regardless of whether we make a decision that is consistent with what you'd like, um, please understand that we do value and respect your opinions and perspectives. So thanks for sharing them. And uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Um, and Trustee Mudd? Um, nothing big to report. Just um, wanted to say um, Happy New Year's. Um, and uh, let's see, over the past month, I have um, I attended a Brown Act seminar, which was um, very informative. Um, and along with um, Trustee Serpengal and um, Superintendent Mount Benitez also attended the San Mateo CSBA new trustee orientation this past weekend um, and have spent a significant amount of time as well writing to our local officials asking for a speedy and efficient rollout of the vaccine for our teachers. Um, and just want to give a big thank you to um, our staff and administration and teachers for all of the incredibly hard work you've been doing to prepare um, for our safe return. So thank you. We're, Mike, it's going to be great. Great. Thank you. Um, and I don't have a big report either. I wanted to thank the district for um, sending out the resources to parents last week to help them um, uh, talk with their children about what's been going on. And um, thank you to all the teachers and staff who have been providing support for our children while you yourselves are processing this information. Um, yeah, and, and so I, since the last meeting, I have, uh, I attended the board liaison uh, meeting, which is between the board and the teachers um, and the district staff. And um, 
we had a really good conversation uh, about like grade level meetings and also a good conversation about communication between um, the board and teachers and what the role of the board is. Um, so I really appreciate that we have that committee and I'm, I'm glad that I can serve on it. All right, so next we have um, board communication. Uh, do we have any board communications at this meeting, Kirsten? No, okay. No, President Kendall. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, so moving on to the consent agenda. Do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I can make a motion to approve the consent agenda. All right, I'll and second. I'll second it. Oh, who, who second it? Who's I'll cute? second it. Okay, great. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Okay, so moving on down here. All right. We are, um, we're on the item on justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. So I believe this is uh, Dr. Joelle Spencer, who will be speaking with us. Yes, there she is. Hi. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Dr. Joelle Spencer. I'm your director of special education. Um, good evening, trustees, Burlingame community, and happy new year. Um, joining me tonight is uh, Sarah Maloney. She's one of our school psychologists. I uh, just want to make sure she's on. Sarah, are you on? Hey, Dr. Spencer, I'm on and able to speak now. All right. Thank you for being here, Sarah, and I'm excited to present with you. Um, so I, I'll go ahead and share my screen. And everyone can see that. Um, so for tonight's JEDI presentation, we will be focusing on special education data from a few different perspectives. Earlier this school year, Marla presented on a variety of Jet JEDI topics, which focused more on broad data and unduplicated data. Tonight, we will be digging a little bit deeper into special education data and um, taking that perspective. Keeping that in mind, I kind of like you all to think of our special education data as a snapshot in time. It does fluctuate with students qualifying and ed exiting from special education throughout the school year. And also students move in and out of the school year. So it could even um, fluctuate a few students from day to day. Um, and a little bit about our department before we move on to the next slide. Um, we have historically maintained about 300 students in special education. Um, but again, our number can fluctuate from day to day. And based on the data you see tonight, we have about 8.4% 8, 8 of our BSD population identified as special education. In California, our state average is about 109 Okay. And as always, we keep BSD's vision and mission on the forefront as educators um, to prepare our students for their future. Okay, so the next two slides focus on looking at our historical special education population by disability. Um, this may appear a little bit um, familiar to our veteran um, trustees. Uh, we presented on, uh, Marla actually presented on it last year. So San Mateo used to actually provide this report to us um, every school year, but um, for the last few years, they discontinued that. And locally, we have pulled this data to add on. So you see down here, we have 2020 um, update. A few notable trends on this slide, we have historically seen a decrease um, a decreasing trend in students identified with speech language impairments. Um, this is likely due um, to the last few years, our speech language pathologists have begun um, implementing um, universal articulation screenings for kindergartners. 
And we're also trained very intensely in ex exit and entrance criteria for speech language impairment. This really allowed us to calibrate across the district and make sure our practices were up to um, code. And last year, um, Marla had noted, we are seeing a slight upward trend um, here in students identified with emotional disturbance. Um, in other words, those are students with significant mental health needs that um, may have anxiety or depression, et cetera. Um, school refusal is also a, a big one. Um, and this does follow trends um, here locally on the peninsula. This is a continuation of the same data. Um, we actually have 13 disability categories. Um, and on this slide, um, there's a slight increase in um, specific learning disability. Um, just a little bit of history here. Um, in 2017, um, California released new dyslexia guidelines and the term phonological processing was added to the, the criteria and our recent upward trend in the last few years is likely uh, related to this addition. Other disability categories in the district, um, they don't have notable trends, but we all, always like to take a look every year. Um, we pull this data on December 1st. So I will pass it over to Sarah for the next slide. Yeah, so as we do track, of course, the categories of disability, our data does kind of dive a little bit deeper into grade levels. Um, so in the next two slides, you're going to see the grade level populations in special education. And this allows us to identify uh, grade level bubbles. So we can see um, if there's a bubble kind of moving throughout the grades, which as a district, it very much helps us with um, informing us of staffing needs coming up and general trends that we're seeing throughout the district. Now that yellow trend line that you can see here, that indicates our students that are currently in eighth grade. So it's tracking their progress as a cohort from preschool on to eighth grade. So if you go down, oh, thank you. So as we go through the, the different grade levels, it's not uncommon as Dr. Spencer mentioned to see changes throughout the years. Um, but even within a specific cohort, we can see changes. This um, is often due to many students graduating out of um, special education, for example, for like speech or language disorder, if they had a articulation um, air, they might graduate out of special education. But then we also see quite a few children who enter special education for the first time around th third grade for specific learning disabilities. Um, and we can see general trends. I believe one of the common trends is a little bit of a bubble in our current third and sixth grade populations. So we kind of track those throughout the years to make sure we are better prepared and um, have our staffing needs met. Great, thank you, Sarah. Um, moving on to our next three slides, they are formatted in the, sim in a, the same manner. Um, so on the left side of the um, chart here, we have a pie chart of our total BSD population. And on the right-hand side is our special education population. This first slide focuses on both duplicated and unduplicated students, specifically students who are EL or English learners, um, Title I, um, or a combination of the two. So as you can see, there is a slightly higher percentage of Title I students and duplicated Title I and EL students in special education when compared to the larger BSD commu um, community on the left. We are continuing our focus um, as a, a staff and a, a community um, and educating others that special education is not a remediation or an intervention for struggling learners or learners that have missed um, instruction due to attendance. Um, this will be a continued focus, I think, um, as our distance learning format um, kind of continues, it does 
um, place certain student groups at, uh, at higher risk, um, such as EL and Title I students. Um, so can, we'll be continuing our monitoring of students through screeners and benchmark data to ensure that there are tiered levels of su support for struggling students prior to a referral to special education. Can I ask about that, Joelle? Sure. Um, so when an EL student is being evaluated, is, are the, uh, is the assessment <laughs> language? Yes, so um, we actually have um, trained all of our psychologists in um, cultural and linguistic um, assessment practices. And we also determine if the student is bilingual, what their dominant language is, and then they would be um, evaluated in their dominant language. So um, yes, we do look at that. So um, that's another part of the, um, the education we're providing to our staff and our community, just um, making sure people know that there are differences between a, a language delay or a language disability and a second language acquisition um, difficulty. Right, do, do these um, assessment tools come in like a Spanish version? Like, is there a Spanish whisk? Is there a Spanish, you know, like rat? I mean, yes. that's all, okay. Um, there are some languages that are more um, uncommon that they are not normed for. Um, so we, we do have to um, sometimes hire an interpreter um, that can interpret, but we have to disclose that on the student's report and they use sometimes anecdotal information in combination with the, um, the formalized assessment, if that okay. makes sense. Sorry to keep harping on this. So yeah. if you're, if you're administering like, so to a Spanish speaking um, child, the administer, administrator doesn't have to be fluent in Spanish in order to give it or they do? So for Spanish, um, yes, it does. Um, there's a separate um, assessment battery for Spanish um, speaking students and it is normed. We have people in our district who are fluent enough to do that? We do. Um, okay. We actually have a really talented psychologist and um, that's bilingual Spanish and then also a speech language pathologist that's bilingual Spanish. Mm -hmm. If um, say a student needed a bilingual OT we sometimes um, call upon others in the county. We, we currently do not have a bilingual occupational therapist. Um, does, that, does that make sense and answer your question? Mm -hmm. All right, great. Okay, so I'm gonna pass it over to Sarah for the next slide. Yeah, so this slide, um, it's kind of following the same trend that Dr. Spencer is showing or the same visuals, but this one is more about tracking our students um, per ethnicity and race. Uh, this is very important. We track it as a district, but so does uh, the CDE, and we work with the CDE on this. So again, on the, um, you can see the district-wide population on the left and the special education population on the right. And it's pretty easy here to make a visual comparison um, based upon the colors and see the similarities and discrepancies between the two and the races. The one that is probably the most apparent um, is the disproportionality identified of Latinx students identified as learning disabled. So Burlingame, Game, as a school district, we were disproportionate in this area for three years in a row, starting in 20, the school year of 2016, 17, going to 2018, 19. Um, we are actually currently out of this disproportionality tracked by the CDE. And that has been a huge testament to a lot of work done by our community and our staff, um, exactly like Dr. Spencer was just talking about the extra trainings on providing um, culturally responsive and linguistically appropriate assessments and not misidentifying students. Um, we do continue to track this every year and really it's to highlight if there is a trend and we're going back towards something and if we need to continue with more training in a certain area or not. Um, and it's really, it's exactly why we do these data polls to make sure that these trends are being monitored and um, paid attention to so that staff can have better informed practices. Can I ask a question about that one? Yes, please. Uh, so <clears throat> I know that, um, you know, people are monitoring um, 
over identification, but how about under identification? Because if you look at the Chinese population, it's disproportionately low for their, um, you know, their slice of our total population. Is that, um, can that be attributed to either under identification or a refusal to accept assessment by those families? Um, I can answer that one, Florence. So we actually have um, other um, activities called targeted monitoring activities. So um, child find or the identification of the whole population in special education, we have a threshold to meet, um, a, a minimum threshold to meet. However, that threshold from what I understand is not parsed out um, by race or ethnicity. Um, so I don't think they monitor a basal for um, disproportionality by race and ethnicity, but if we're over a certain um, population amount, um, they do you know, notify us and um, make sure that we're monitoring those. I can double check on that one and um, get back to you, but I, I believe the, um, the minimum is not tracked for this area. I guess I just worry about that a little bit because at least in you know, clinical psychology, in a lot of Asian cultures, they don't go to therapy. You know, they have lots of um, cultural issues that um, make it so they are less less willing to go, even when there's a clear need. And I'm just wondering if um, we're missing some kids with the Chinese ethnic background who could benefit from special education, but they're not being identified for whatever reason. So. Yeah, I think that's a good um, area to take a little bit of a deeper look in. So mm -hmm. I'll be in touch with you. Okay, any other questions about this slide? Okay, um, and our last slide, um, again, formatted similarly, our total population on the left, special ed on the right. Um, this is parsed out by, by school. So if you take a look at everything here, it's pretty um, proportionate, just glancing at color and the pie, pie charts visually. Um, taking a look at this data year to year is helpful. If there's a trend at a certain school, um, for example, if there's a new program um, implemented at a school and their, their numbers are a little bit different, um, sometimes we're able to see the outcome here. Um, I would like to draw your attention to the salmon color here, um, labeled NPS slash private school. Right. Just to explain a little bit more about um, that. Um, in special education, we are required to monitor identified special education private school students. So these are students whose parents um, place them in private schools, but are um, still Burlingame residents. So um, Burlingame School District doesn't um, uh, pay for education for these students, but we still track them and offer evaluations at public expense. Um, whereas NPS or non-public school students are students referred um, to specialized schools through the IEP process. So these NPS students typically have significant physical, cognitive, and or mental health needs. And you can see this slice right here, NPS private school and the total population, that is actually these students. Um, we are not required to um, track general ed private school students that are Burlingame residents. So I just wanted to kind of explain that in a little more detail. Any questions? Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, first, thank you. That was a great presentation. And, and Sarah, I think we met last week. And we'll see, and I'll see you tomorrow. Um, so with these numbers, it, I'm assuming these are all students that have an IEP. They're not working off of a 504. Yes, that's correct. And do we ever include students that have a 504 in this data just to sort of understand the numbers of uh, like all like who's being served and and for what like I 
one example would be the special or the um the category that you were mentioning with the increase of dyslexia lots of those kids i assume probably haven't qualified but they're working off of a 504 so we would still want to see that data correct um so Right now, we don't have a system that would track the 504s by disability. Mm -hmm. So um, I could definitely do a, a power school search to um, indicate how many um, 504 stu students are being um, served on 504 at different school sites. Um, but we don't have a way to differentiate um, that this particular student is served on a 504 with dyslexia. For this. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Um, any other questions? I just have a quick question on the slide that Sarah talked about with the um, tracking the different grades, the preschool number, where does that number come from? Okay, so preschool is mostly um, students identified with speech or language impairments. Um, so um, these students are age three to five. And actually, a lot of our referrals for speech only students come from the Golden Gate Regional Center. So they were um, even identified younger than three, and then they're referred up to us. We also have um, a preschool that serves students with more um, significant um, disabilities. Uh, it's often referred to as a SDC. And we have a few inclusive preschool students in that classroom. So um, currently, I believe we have um, five students in that classroom. So about five students with significant needs and the, the rest would theoretically be um, students with speech or language impairments. Got it. I'm just, I'm wondering because the preschool number then going into the next year tends to drop down so significantly every year. Does that mean that people leave the area and, or we don't track them or they end up not coming into public school? What's the, the change? So um, this is kind of the neat part to see preschoolers. Um, a lot of times it means that they are responding to the intervention that okay. we're providing in speech therapy. And it is very common that a student um, quote unquote graduates out of special education um, if they have a, a articulation difficulty when they're very young, um, it is common that um, they exit out that way. Awesome, that's great. Yeah. Would it preschool also represent more years? Um, yes, so yes. Be two of so all three-year-olds, all four-year-olds mm -hmm. and five-year-olds until their kindergarten or TK age. Yeah. Thank you, that's and great. Yeah. Does anyone else have any questions? Well, that's the end of our presentation if there aren't any more questions. And um, thank you so much for having Sarah and I tonight. Um, we always love presenting on special ed. So. Yeah, thank you for putting this all together. It's really impressive what you guys have done on the disproportionate um, work there with, yeah. and with the task force you brought together. So that's really awesome. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Have a nice night. You too. Bye-bye. Okay. So now we're moving on to the school accountability report card, the first read, and this is uh, Marla Silversmith. Hi, good evening. Thank you. So this is the first read of the school accountability report cards. The school uh, accountability report cards are um, provided for each school, all seven of our schools. They go to two reads through the school board and have to be posted and approved and up to CDE by um, February 1st of every year. So um, they review uh, information such as our facilities, our human resources, making sure that our teachers are credentialed. They talk about the mission, mission and the vision of the district um, and the supports, including funding that each school receives. So we are bringing them forward to you tonight. There are a couple of clerical errors that we will change before the second read. Um, and we're bringing them forward for discussion. Um, I have to just say, I loved reading them. They were, it was so fun to read about the different personalities of each school and all of the different programs. And um, it, it really made me excited to be able to someday actually go to the school. 
person. Historically, they've gone along with the SIPSAS, which are the single plan for student achievement. Um, however, those will be going further down in the spring due to the LCAP changes. So these are coming on their own this year. So there's a lot of great information you'll learn about our schools through the SIPSAS and the SARCs. Silver Smith, could you just please uh, briefly comment on the clerical errors so that if any public members are looking, they, they understand what, what changes uh, we need to make for second read? Sure. Um, under Lincoln Elementary School, in the narrative, it mentions Principal Guidi, who was able to retire last June, and we need to replace that with Principal Afshar. So that's one of them. The other component is uh, throughout it, you'll see where it's mentioning dad's clubs and we'll be, we'll be extracting those because those are not, um, we worked with the dad's clubs and rebranded those this year. So that those will be coming out too. Um, and then, sorry, let me go back to my note. I believe that those are the, those are the um, ones that we will be pulling right now. I asked just a quick question. Yes. So I agree with what Lisa said. I love this format. It was just super easy to read. I love the principal statements. I thought it was great. Um, the only question, so I just have a couple of questions, well, one question really around the funding, um, the per student funding mm -hmm. and um, the structure of the restricted versus unrestricted. So I kind of read the footnotes, but I'm just wondering, can you give us a little more information on what's in the, the unrestricted? Does that include teacher salary? Is that everything? Is it just um, curriculum information? I just want to get a little bit of understanding of that. Trustee Reed, that is a wonderful question. Um, I can answer it globally. And then if Superintendent Mampanegis would like to add anything, I would, I would absolutely ask for him too. Um, so, so the funding is we give students, we give uh, school funding per based on a student, right? So based on their students, they get an amount of money. Um, on top of that, they also might receive like Title I funds, which might be for students that are free and reduced lunch or EL and, and components like that. So that's in there. Also, at some times, PTAs funnel, will funnel money through a school, for instance, if they're, if they're hiring a, a bus driver to go on a field trip. So that can differentiate between the schools as to the funding. Um, and then there's restrict, so the restricted funds means that we have very strict guidelines as to what we can use that money, who we can use it for and what we can use it for versus unrestricted funds. So um, does that kind of answer it? And I don't know, Superintendent, if there's anything that you would like to add to that. Uh, no, I, I think that you might wanna to touch on uh, how we distribute uh, per pupil uh, principal discretionary money for Title I. Yes, so um, Title I within the Burlingame School District, if you remember, we bring the con app to you and we talk about our Title I students and we and what we feel, where we feel the money should go to. In Burlingame, all three of our, our highest uh, percentage of schools with students that are within Title I receive funding. Those three schools this year, and it changed, it can fluctuate every year. This year it's McKinley, Washington, and Roosevelt that are all receiving supplemental Title I funds. Okay. And uh, I know like uh, you receive different base amounts, right? Based on the, the grade of the children. So it makes sense that BIS would have a higher per pupil, right? Uh, so, so the other thing is, is that we give the, the same amount per pupil to principals for discretionary spending at every school site. So that's, that's actually equal depending upon the enrollment. Um, but they also then get the, so the, the restricted money that, that Assistant Superintendent Silversmith is, is referencing uh, really depends upon the enrollment and the different types of students at the schools as well as PTA activity. Um, so, uh, and we only in Burlingame, this, it's a little unusual, but we have so few Title I students. The reason that we only give money to the three with the most Title I students on a per pupil basis is because it's such a small amount of money that when we get beyond the first three, it's, 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 it's inconsequential. So they pooled it so that the three with the most students get, get the money. And then are you dividing the Title I money equally among those three schools or it's proportional to the number of kids they have? It's proportional. Okay. And so, so let's just like compare uh, like McKinley and Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. Um, so per pupil, McKinley says 10,000 something, Roosevelt says 12,000 something. They're both Title I schools, um, restricted, looks higher for Roosevelt. So 
that would imply there are more children there with Title I? Uh, it would imply that their PTA is, is funneling more money through the district for things like field trips. Okay. Okay. So that's, that's kind of what I wanted to see. So there's a, there can be a pretty big difference uh, between schools just simply from PTA fundraising. Yes. Yep. Yeah. The biggest differentiator that you're seeing is actually uh, based on PTA fundraising and all PTA funds don't come to the district. It's only those funds that they want us to use to pay for their activities. Uh, uh, so the example that, that uh, Marley used is a good one. So if they're chartering a bus for a field trip, or if, or if they have to engage in a contract with an outside vendor, such as a, a place that they're going for a field trip that they want the district to, to actually sign off and, and the board to approve, uh, then all of that actually goes to the district. So, so PTAs don't have a cap of what they can bring into their schools then? There's absolutely no, no guidelines. It's up to every individual PTA. Um, the interesting thing is, is that um, BCE and PTA have been engaged in a really interesting project. Um, I've gotten a chance to listen in. It's not something that I'm uh, participating in other than as a participant, um, that they're looking at a, at a more unified one give to combine all the fundraising for BCE and PTA. It's in sort of the theoretical exploration stages at this point. The most interesting thing I've seen out of that, though, is they did an analysis of the amount of money being uh, raised at each school site by PTAs, and it actually uh, varies dramatically. I don't think anybody's probably ever looked at it before. Yeah, I was always under the impression for some reason that there was a cap and then whatever they made over that cap, they were encouraged to make then a donation to the BCE fund. Uh, I think there's guidelines, but, but PTAs are independent organizations, so that can't be mandated. Right, but those those conversations, they were very difficult conversations that BCE and PTA Council were having like several years ago. Um, <clears throat> and I was sitting in there probably as like CDAC chair when those first things were first being discussed and it was pretty contentious. Um, so we're seeing still differences between sites, but I can't imagine what the difference was per site way back right. before those conversations happened because they were even able to hire like te music teachers and art teachers and like people. So just the fact that that's not allowed anymore, I think is a really like has helped, you know, equity wise, but we still have a ways to go. Looks like it. Um, I don't wanna jump to a new topic if we're staying with the, um, the budget questions within that, but um, so if anyone wants to continue, let me know. But I was also curious about um, so many of the schools had really interesting programs and um, like, I'll just, I'll, um, I'll use McKinley for instance, or Washington, they have, Washington uses Odyssey of the Mind, um, McKinley uses MTSS, PBIS, um, Junior Great Books. I was wondering within, I'm assuming each school sort of has their own autonomy to choose what reflects their culture and what, what is best for their community. Is there a time where they can like share out or collaborate um, and talk with, communicate, collaborate with one another and That's share true. what best practices are? coming out of that? So our principals meet twice a, twice a month together. And then there's grade level meetings throughout the district. Um, and in each, the narrative that you're referencing, Trustee Mudd, is actually written by principals and, and their schools. So they're highlighting what's important to them. I can tell you that um, all, all six of our schools, well, actually BIS also has MTSS, which looks at our tiered systems for academic behavioral and uh, social emotional supports. So, so a lot of them have all of those components, but they pick what they, what they're, um, what they're proud, on and right. writing about. Yes. Thank yes. You. Okay. Yeah. That's a great question though. Um, and then when you see the SIPSAs, that's why I referenced the SIPSAs earlier, it's much more detailed. You'll see goals that are aligned to the LCAP for that school in those areas. Got it. So when those come to you in the spring, you'll see a little bit more, but you'll see a lot of that common language, you know, like MTSS, um, SEL, so social emotional learning, 
multi-tiered systems of support, uh, positive behavior intervention strategies, all of that language you'll see throughout. That's happening across the district. Okay, right. so are there, well, okay, I would imagine junior grade books is probably one of those where there's probably a teacher on staff that's trained in junior grade books pro program. Does he or she ever get an opportunity to share what junior grade books is doing within her classroom or his so classroom? Every so every Thursday in Burlingame, we do what we call Thirst for Knowledge Thursdays and teachers or staff are available to, to teach a professional learning opportunity. So we've had a lot of people come forward and want to teach on um, whether it be like a, a Jedi component, um, you know, connecting with kids of color within their classroom or indigenous people. Um, but, it, but any teacher can come forward and teach on that, including for literature or books. So, so there are opportunities for teachers to do that. The other thing is, is um, you know, something that I think is really great is we're a really nice small district and it's nice to see and hear, I actually heard of an opportunity yesterday where in a grade level meeting, somebody said, hey, I heard you're doing this at this school. Can I see how it's working? What does that look like? So we do have those times to connect to. That's great. Okay, thank you. Oh, can I just say one thing, Marla? I think you can stick these sarks on your bulletin board because I did not see typos and grammatical errors. Trusty Wong, can you please come by and sign for me? Because I have all of your hands on my wall. I, I want to take some credit for that <laughs> <laughs> because I pounded it into everybody. <laughs> Absolutely. So please come by. I'd like for you to autograph them for me. I will. <laughs> but a plus. Yes, yes. We worked on it. Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, thank you so much. Are there any other questions or we're, we can move on to the next item? Okay. Thank you, Marla. Thank you. All yeah. right. Um, so now we are on, in the business finance section and we're going to have our champions childcare presentation um, with Brendan Bernardo. And there's Brendan. Hello. Everyone hear me and see me okay? We can hear you and see you okay. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me. Um, and I actually have a PowerPoint and I have some technical difficulties, but Kirsten uh, is supposedly going to help me out and possibly share that PowerPoint. Um, so if she could do that now, that would be awesome. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and start. Um, so my name is Brennan Bernardo, and uh, I'm the area manager for Champions. Uh, in the Burlingame market. And I'm also joined with uh, Dee Phillips. She's the regional director. So she takes the entire uh, California market. So we'll have a presentation and then some questions. And I just really quickly wanted to say hello to the board. Haven't uh, talked to you guys all in a while in the new year and to the new board members. So just quickly saying hi, but let's hop right into it. Um, so we can go to the next slide, please. So we wanna talk about the champions difference uh, and those being engagement, curriculum, quality, inclusion, and partnership. These are the key factors that differentiate champions from other brands. And we use these uh, in combination with our service values uh, to keep the focus on serving the community uh, and the students here in Burlingame. Uh, next slide, please. This is our uh, continuous improvement model. And at Champions, we're constantly assessing and improving, and we're always open to feedback. Uh, we've made amazing relationships with students, families, districts, uh, the district and the principals. And uh, we use communication to partner with the district to ensure that we're adapting to any changes that may come our way. And we love any and all types of feedback. We seek out feedback from the families, from the principals, and even uh, our own employees. Uh, next slide, please. Here's a quick update on some wins and some misses. Uh, to highlight some things that we've done well, uh, we did hire over 60 teachers since August. Uh, in addition, we retain 75% of the existing staff. Uh, we're continuing to scale staffing to meet the demand uh, of the market here in Burlingame. Uh, we've made amazing relationships. We've partnered with the city, with Parks and Rec, with the county, with the Four Cs, uh, with the previous care provider, with the district, including COVID testing and communication, and, and also with the families. Right now, our current Enrollment is sitting right around 140 students. And we've made an amazing effort with health and safety this year. Uh, only two uh, Burlingame Champions employees have tested positive so far with a zero positive 
transference in sight, uh, which is really amazing. Uh, we share in the responsibility here in the Burlingame community uh, when it comes to slowing the spread of COVID-19 and Champions is continuing to provide uh, a safe place for stu students to learn and to grow. Some areas of opportunity, we had wait lists in October. Uh, Champions is continuing to avoid these as we look ahead towards the transition to the in-person model. And we're doing this by continuously hiring and uh, using licensing to get access to more space so that we can operate to meet the existing demand. We did have three site directors leave their roles and we have one director role left to fill. We anticipate that position uh, being secured by the 25th of January. Uh, there have been two licensing violations. Uh, these dealt with supervision and have been cleared with licensing. Uh, next slide, please. So this year, we couldn't get through a PowerPoint without talking about health and safety. Uh, next slide, please. So here are uh, some of our standards uh, for health and safety. We comply with all CDC, uh, San Mateo County Health, licensing uh, health and safety guidelines, as well as any more strict standards, uh, if there are any, uh, through district protocol. We work with the district to ensure things like a closed campus, uh, wellness, screening, check-ins, use of PPE, sanitization, social distancing. Uh, these have all yielded a, a really strong result. Um, additionally, we will quarantine uh, as needed for travel or the holidays or as deemed necessary by the county. Our company has put an emphasis on teachers having access to vaccinations when that time comes, including paying for the time it takes for our champions employees to get the shot and ensuring that they do not pay out of pocket. Uh, next slide, please. So we wanna talk about quality curriculum and inclusion. Uh, next slide, please. Champions curriculum has social emotional learning. Uh, at Champions, we use the research-based Sanford Harmony learning materials to focus on social emotional learning as well as emotional wellness. Our welcome activities include the Sanford Harmony SEL strategy of meetup. And this is a time when children will gather uh, to monitor agreements, exchange ideas, share experiences and solve problems. We incorporate the buddy up system as well to intentionally bring uh, diverse peers together to get to know one another, form really strong relationships and connections. Our curriculum is uh, project-based, uh, which is helpful for supporting uh, learning loss. It's also trauma sensitive, uh, which is important. It supports kids' needs to feel safe and supported. Uh, Champions also has formed an advisory caucus that focuses on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And this caucus provides direction for our company as we're working to develop a strategy that addresses the problems of systemic racism. We also spend time focusing on anti-bias and implicit bias awareness training for our teachers during their personal development days. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanna talk uh, quickly about the partnership and the relationships we've made here in Burlingame. Next slide. So we were a part of the San Mateo County Child Care Task Force. We were an integral part of this uh, committee in April, which included members from uh, Burlingame and Hillsboro School Districts, San Mateo County uh, employees, uh, City of Burlingame employees, Four Season Champions. We met weekly at the onset of the pandemic to go through strategies, uh, to talk about sharing information, site inspections, and any changing healthcare uh, and health and safety regulations. Uh, we've been an incredible partner uh, for the community during this unprecedented time. We provided first essential care uh, for healthcare workers back in April of 2020. And if we go to the next slide, I'll show you um, another thing too. Here's a picture of a really fun event. This was held at the Mills uh, Peninsula Hospital on April 22nd. And this uh, is where a bunch of the students um, at Champions, um, Franklin, they made a bunch of thank you signs, uh, you know, for all the first responders, uh, calling them heroes and the hospital staff. Um, it was covered by the media. It's on YouTube and uh, the signs were a hit and everyone was um, very appreciative of that event. 
Um, and on the last slide, this is our thank you slide. I just want to say thank you so much. We are so happy to uh, be in service to the community here in Burlingame. We're very fortunate. I'm personally very appreciative uh, to work in a community where there's so much engagement um, by the parents, hardworking principals, a very responsive and communicative board and district that just honestly helps me through my job. And so just on behalf of everyone at Champions, I just wanted to say thank you uh, so much for allowing us to uh, impact the lives of all the students here in Burlingame. And we wanted to also open it up for any questions. Yeah, thank you, Brendan. Are there any questions from the board? I have a couple quick ones. First of all, um, a huge thank you to Champions. I know you guys have turned your business model upside down like so many other people to accommodate so many kids in the community and we really appreciate it. Um, the question I had for you was with um, kids starting to get back on campus and in the classrooms on the 20th, is that gonna impact your spacing? Is there anything you need to reassess or is it gonna have an impact on clearing the wait list or anything like that? Um, I would say yes and no, not immediately um, because we're pretty aware of, well, you know, just full transparency. Enrollment has dipped a little bit in the last three weeks and we just really think it's due to this um, surge that's happening right now. But no, we don't anticipate that being a challenge. Um, there isn't any um, more favorable outcome with regard to capacities uh, mm -hmm. that an in-person model provides for us. Right. And uh, if anything, we're gonna get access to more and more space. So, um, and, and really kind of that's just a part of our job. So if all of a sudden in-person is a big hit and we are now uh, phasing in both the younger and the older grades, and everyone wants to be on campus, you know, that's fine. It'll just be a, a quick matter of time to get access to more space and get some more teachers. Uh, so no, we, we're really staying in front of it. Um, and uh, yeah, we, you know, we'll, we'll make any adjustments if, there are, if there's a huge surge in demand. Awesome, great. Are there any other questions? So Brennan, the, the issue, I'm not sure how to describe it, like the bottleneck for you guys is that you needed more staff and more space um, and it just, is there, is it just the state licensing just takes a while to approve the space? Is that what the problem was? Yeah, it, yeah, exactly right. That will become more favorable as we phase to in-person and even a second time when we phase all grade levels to in-person, there's a more favorable labor model that allows us to reappropriate staff. Mm -hmm. But the, the challenge is we're used to having 24 students in a room and now we can only have you know, 14 or 13. Uh, and so that's the big challenge. And if what you're referring to is licensing delays, that uh, there that did happen. Um, and um, that was really just an issue with Sacramento, but they're starting to um, come around on that. The waivers and waiver extensions are now gonna come out in 90 day periods instead of 30 day. So we don't really anticipate any licensing issues, um, nothing that would be unforeseen. Um, so I think we're, we're looking good there, um, but there was a bottleneck and it really was access to new space and it was California wide. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry if I missed this before, about how many kids do you have participating in the program right now? Right now it's around 140, um, but as we get access to more space, which we're currently doing and you know thinking positive as, uh, more and more people want to go in person and and you know come back and, and join up with champions um, that will increase as we get access to more space um, so and again enrollment is probably a little depressed right now just from uh, you know people um, worried about you know uh, health and safety but there really is no concern again we've had no uh, transmission in sight and uh, that's a really uh, something that we're really really proud of um, so yeah, we do think, expect that number to grow as we kind of come out of this second surge and get access to more space and everyone transitions back to in-person. Thank you. Are there other questions? No? Okay, well, thank you so much for um, sharing with us about how it's been going with Champions and for all the hard work you guys are doing, so thank you. Thanks for having me. Bye. Bye. All right, so moving along to Tim Ryan, our facilities and bond coordinator. Uh, we have the uh, adopting the pre-qualification process for 
um, MEP subcontractors. Good evening again, trustees. Actually, uh, I'll, I'll take care of uh, both of these items. So we, okay. we have 19.2 and 19.3, uh, two resolutions which just update uh, our packet for pre-qualifications. 19.2 is specifically for subcontractors and 19.3 is for prime or general contractors. And so our packets are updated every time that there's a, a law change uh, that, that requires uh, an update. And so that's what you have attached to both of these items is the new packet for pre-qualification for doing work in our school district and our construction program. Great, thanks. Are there any questions on this? Nope. Okay. Well, these are both action items. So we do need to take a vote. Um, so do we have a motion on 19.2? I'll make a motion on 19.2 resolution number 2021-11, adopting pre-qualification process for MEP subcontractors pursuant to public contract code section 20111.6. I'll second. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. So then we have 19.3 also. So does anyone, I, I think, I mean, no one has any questions on that either, right? So uh, do you want to make a motion? I'll make a motion to approve 19.3 resolution number 2020-21-12, adopting pre-qualification process for prime contractors pursuant to public contract code sections 20111.5 and 2011.6. Second. Great, thanks. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Great. Okay, so we have our um, last item pretty much. Okay, so uh, the next item is the BEA Sunshine Negotiations. And I believe this is uh, Marla. Yes, correct. Thank you, President Kendall. Um, good evening. The last item of tonight is our Burlingame Education Association Sunshine Proposal. Um, I believe I will be joined by Brian McManus, the president of what we call BEA, or again, Burlingame Education Association. Um, we are both bringing forward to you a proposal letter tonight. This is the first read. It will come in a second read in February. We are going forward with our contract actually ends, our three-year contract ends June of 2021. So we are looking at starting the contract um, July of 2021 through June of 2024. So Brian, are you available? I will go ahead and um, share mine. Will he, they promote him? There he is. Perfect. Okay. So um, we are we are requesting that BEA meets with us to discuss Article Three, hours of employment; Article Seven, professional assessment; Article Twelve, inclusive education; Article Fourteen, illness and injury leave; Article Fifteen, part-time employment. And all of these can also be found if you're interested in more information on the Burlingame um, website. If you go under BurlingameSchools.org and you go to Departments, HR. You can read uh, it, the in-depth contract, which has these articles. Mr. McManus, would you like me to share yours? Be able to unmute. No, why don't you go oh, ahead? That, that okay? okay. There he is. Oh, there, there he is. is. Me now? Okay. Yes, we can hear you. <clears throat> okay. Thanks, Marla. Um, so the Burlingame Education Association was very similar. Um, we uh, would like to open up Article 3, Hours of Employment, Article 7, Professional Assessment, and Article 8, Just Cause and Due Process, Article 14, Leave, Article 12, Inclusion Education. Those two should be reversed. And Article 17, Wages, but it says Article 18, but that's a mistake. I don't want to, we're not going to be opening up Article 18, but it's neither here nor there, because we won't be writing on it. Um, I did put a little note down there. Uh, I'd like to read it. It's something that the Burlingame Education Association is really passionate about. Um, currently, uh, there are well, 13 teachers in the music and PE department. 
And of those teachers, two of six of the PE teachers have tenure and are permanent employees in the Berlin Game School District and three of seven of the, uh, excuse me, three of seven of the PE teachers have tenure. Um, and so four of them are non-permanent employees. Um, and we, we feel that these positions are funded through BCE, we know, and that's a non, uh, it's not a reliable source of funding, but in the 25 years that I've worked here, um, these positions have always been funded by BCE uh, and BCE's funding has increased to the district five times since I've been here. It was close to $600,000 a year when I was first hired and now it's over 2 million. Um, and BSD has shown in the past that it values these positions. Uh, when we've come across other in, in the past, when we've had budget constraints and issues, music and PE was always protected and always the last thing to be considered to be cut. So uh, we feel that these positions are permanent and should be permanent parts of the school district. And these are dedicated professionals that are valued and respected by the community who deserve to be retained and deserve to be uh, given tenure after showing their um, professionalism, expertise, and reliability. So, so President McManus, I think I think your your comment was around the fact that um, you just wanted to bring that forward. You weren't really sure about the article and it was something you wanted us to discuss, correct? Right, I don't know. We've I have right. some language. I don't know what, what article that fits so, under. Right. That's why I'm just bringing that, making that yeah. public right now. But um, I, in talking with um, Greg Dennis, the district lawyer, he he's told me that this is sort of a, it's a, uh, it's a board issue. So, yeah. so just to protect negotiations away from the table, this is, this is one of the items that uh, Mr. McManus, President McManus would like for us to discuss during our negotiations. Um, so we are again, first reads tonight, second read will be February 9th. And Brian, we can work on updating yours to remove article 18. And then we will go ahead and start negotiating um, with our BEA in good faith. And we look forward to working with them. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Does anybody have any questions for uh, President McManus or myself? I, if, I, if I could, I, I did have a few questions. Um, well, one, um, Mr. McManus, I, I think you, you may wanna go to the Trustee Wong School of Typo uh, Management, um, uh, just kind of reading your letter, but um, I guess a question for everybody, um, be, because I'm new and, and I don't really understand. Like, I understand that kind of by law we need to we need to go to the um, you know the public and and give them the opportunity to <clears throat> to express themselves regarding these proposals. Like, wh what would one of us or one of the public express regarding these proposals? Given that it's just kind of a list of topics rather than like w what it is about those topics so if yeah so if i i, I can help a little bit there uh uh trustee sarpengal uh, so the sunshine provision uh is re is required by uh code so that the public is aware of what is going to be discussed behind closed doors and negotiations um, it is the opportunity for the public to make any general statements they would like to uh, but what actually you just saw uh, Assistant Super, Superintendent Silversmith do is um, uh, what we aren't allowed to do is to negotiate in public. So, so we sunshine them um, so that it's clear to the public what the two teams will be discussing behind closed doors. Um, but they have to be careful because they aren't allowed to actually bargain in public. They have to bargain behind closed doors. So, so other than making general comments, the sunshine provision is less an opportunity for the community to, to question or or comment, it's more of a legal requirement so that, that we're making it clear that negotiations are underway um, and that they are uh, to be held in confidence until the negotiations is concluded. Absolutely, no, thanks for explaining that because I, I understand the purpose of it. I, I, yeah. I, I was less clear about the purpose of the public expressing themselves. 
So um, I mean, somebody could sign up and certainly say everything from good luck to, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, I noticed that this thing is sunshine and it's about darn time, but usually there's no comment. Uh, I, so in the six districts I've worked at, I've actually never heard a public comment on the sunshine agreement, but I guess it would be, it is, it is technically possible. Okay. Well, I guess my, my comment would be like all of the topics that are listed in both of the respective proposals seem like important topics. Okay, do we have, I think, any anything else? Or can we take a motion on this? There's, um, this is actually first read, second read, which will okay. be the final comes in on the February 9th. It's listed as an action item. I was, oh, <laughs> sorry. sorry. Thank you for that. <laughs> I was, thank you for the clarification. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So moving on to board requested items. Um, so we, yes, I just wanted to put it out there. I know we said we we're going to talk about um, the waiver. We're going to get a um, recap at the February 9th meeting. I just want to, I know there's been conversation around adding third through fifth. So I just wanted to ask Superintendent Mampanitas if we would be able to structure it um, as a, a vote to add third through fifth to the waiver when that comes around in conversation. Sure. Yeah, uh, we had a lot of requests, which I know, uh, uh, trustees, you've seen uh, some of them as well that we that we agendize it for this evening's meeting. However, uh, since our waiver goes into effect on the 20th of January, which is in um, uh, a few days, uh, we did not agendize it because we had already asked Miss Silversmith to report out on how the return goes on February 9th. And so on February 9th, after her informational report on how the return went, I will agendize a discussion uh, and then of course the board can uh, at the conclusion of that uh, discussion uh, direct staff to amend the waiver if they would like uh, uh, to add additional grades if that's what you're you're suggesting you'd like or to leave it as it is. Great. Thank you. Sure. And, and do we need um, do, do we need to formally um, approve the bargaining proposals. No, the uh, the sunshine is a is a first read. There should be a second read at the next board meeting as well. I believe that's also agendized for February 9th. Is that correct, Ms. Silversmith? That is correct. Where it says action item, that's a clerical error. It should say information item tonight. Got it. Great. Thank you. All right. So, is there any other board requested item? No. Okay. Then I think we should adjourn this meeting at seven twenty-seven. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs>